From 11FS, this is Fintech Insider News, and this is your host, Kate Moody. We've just pressed the stop button on this week's show, and there was so much to get into, as always. We're talking about the big stories, including Flutterway Vice to buy Railza. Really, really interesting conversation here about what some of the motivations might be behind this, what some of the benefits might be for Flutterway of this transaction, and some really great perspectives from some local experts on precisely what's happening on the ground in Africa. Our second story is African fintech Nala is expanding into Europe. We're joined by the CEO of Nala, Benjamin, who gives us the inside scoop on precisely what's driving the expansion at this moment in time, what they hope to achieve and the impact that they want to have in Europe for their customers. And Logan Paul apologizes for CryptoZoo project failure. The uh, YouTube celebrity has promised lots for his crypto zoo, but sadly nothing really has come to light so far. So we look into what's driven this and what some of the repercussions might be for Logan Paul and for the crypto industry more generally. We get into all this and much more. But first, a few brief messages. Don't go anywhere. Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider. Watching Insider, 11FS Spotlight. 11FS Explores. Open mic night. After dark. Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. Welcome to episode 695 of Fintech Insider. I'm Kate Moody and I'm joined this week on Fintech Insider News by some great guests to break down this week's biggest stories in fintech and financial services. Firstly, it's a welcome return to Fintech Insider for Weezer Jalakasi, VP of Global Merchant Business at Chipper Cash. Welcome back, Weezer. Great to have you back on the show again. Can you give our audience a reminder of you and Chipper Cash, please? Always a pleasure to be back here and Happy New Year to all of your listeners. Uh, at Chipper Cash, we operate a mobile wallet or payment method that serves about 6 million users across various African countries, making it super easy to transact cross-border, access other financial services like crypto, stocks, cards, etc. And I look after all of the merchant-facing stuff. Brilliant. Well, yeah, definitely lots of news stories that I'm keen to get perspective on today. So thank you very much for, for joining us. We also have a return to Fintech Insider for Charlie Conchi, Investment Editor at City AM. Welcome back to the show, Charlie. What does an investment editor's life and newsbeat look like, Jeremy? What's what's on your desk at the moment? Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's, you know, I've only been in the role technically for about five days now. So it's um, <laughs> I'm still working out as well, but I would describe it as very broad. It covers everything from fintech particularly the kind of money moving in and out of fintech um i do a lot of venture capital um and then more sort of traditional fund management we do some private equity as well um it's a a very broad remit that covers all the goings on in the city of london really is how i'd describe it fantastic well yeah we've got a broad range of stories today so looking forward to, to getting your take on them as well and last but definitely by no means least we have another very welcome return for benjamin fernandez ceo at nala welcome back benjamin how are you doing um we've got some news related to you guys specific later on the show but could you give us a, a top line please to, to yourself and to nala that'd be great cool uh what's up everybody my name is benjamin uh, i'm from tanzania east africa in london today and uh, yeah um, i run nala we do cross-border payments across africa uh, and we're building payment rails um is what we foundationally do but right now we have a consumer product that enables people to send money back to africa to five african countries from the us the uk and very recently the eu Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to get, getting to the news a little bit later on, but let's let's get into our stories. First up, we've got a story that we've taken from Sky News, and that is that African payments giant Flutterwave is vying to buy British fintech Railser. Sky News has learned that Railser, previously known as Rails Bank, is fielding offers from potential buyers, including Flutterwave, which has attracted a multi-billion dollar valuation. One insider said there was heavy competition for the asset, including a consortium comprising a number of existing Railser investors. Railser specializes in embedded finance solutions such as banking services, credit cards, and digital wallets. News of the rival offers for Railser comes as expectations grow of a wave of consolidation in the fintech sector. Flutterwave provides payment infrastructure for global merchants and payment service providers, with headquarters in San Francisco and operations in Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, and seven other African countries. Um, 
Weezer, interested to come to you guys first on this. Obviously, Flutterwave and, and Chipper Cash have, have some overlaps. You know, I think maybe operating out of you know, a similar balance of operating out of San Fran and, and concentration in Africa. Um, and I believe you, you guys might sort of have a, a relationship directly with, with, with Flutterwave as well. You're listed on, on their website. So what was your what was your take on, on this news? What would Rails add to Flutterwave's offering, do you think? Yeah, so <clears throat> firstly, I think it's uh, it's pretty exciting and consistent with um, a trend that seems to be occurring with uh, African-focused companies that are sort of like expanding uh, into the rest of the world through m and I think a more recent example which comes to mind is MFS Africa's acquisition of GT Payments out of the U.S., the card issuing company. And I think this is really, really a, a great move from Flutterwave if it goes through. Um, Railsa has got some of the most sophisticated technology infrastructure for banking as a service that we've had the chance to use. Um, Chipper Cash in, in the UK is essentially built on top of Railsa's Rails. <laughs> that was a lot of Rails to play around with. <laughs> and um, when you look at the, the tech infrastructure, their, their stack, uh, it's very robust and sophisticated. I think that um, if I were Flutterwave, I would be very excited to combine that technology experience um, with the licensing capacity and capability that Flutterwave has in the rest of Africa. I think that many African countries don't even have um, equivalent banking as a service solutions that can be consumed uh, quite as easily and elegantly from a technical perspective. So I think that's like number one, that uh, is a very big opportunity. Secondly, um, from a compliance perspective, Rails uh, has quite a number of um, benefits uh, that it brings to the Flutterwave group. If you look at one of their subsidiaries, Paranet, which is the, the wholly owned licensing subsidiary of Rails, uh, they have an EMI license in the UK and in the EU through Lithuania, as well as an exemption for um, electronic licensing in Singapore. They are also a visa, visa principal issuer for the UK and Europe, and Flutterwave has had to try to foray into the card issuing space before with limited success. And it'll be interesting to see what sort of possibilities unlock themselves if this goes through. Especially when you look at the African markets, the card uh, environment is regulated differently. You typically need a bin sponsor who has to be a bank in order for you to in issue these types of instruments. I think there's a lot that they can draw from the Rails as team's experience building this multi-country bus engine and combining it with their existing licensing capabilities. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity that's un unlocked as a result. Mm, yeah, no, I think definitely really interesting. I mean, how important is that sort of cross-continental element to companies like Flutterwave? I think it's a very big one. Um, Flutterwave, a big part of their business is operating what we call a merchant of record model, where they essentially allow a business like Emirates or Apple to be able to collect in a country like Nigeria or Tanzania in local currency without having to set up local entities in those countries. And then like the merchant of record would sort of like do the collection, deal with all of the local tax and compliance bits, and then effectively settle um the origin merchant in a global major currency, typically in Singapore, the US or the UK. And um, when you look at this uh, emerging markets payment opportunity, that is by far the biggest one that, that really stands out. When you look at global players like Microsoft, Spotify, Amazon, they would struggle to justify a business case to integrate any one single provider. So that aggregation capacity combined with that merchant of record business starts to look very interesting. And for a while, they've had the infrastructure to do that collections component on the continent for a while. But now when you think about like, okay, how do I provision and then, you know, GBP accounts for my biggest merchants and make sure that the funds are settled there. I think this is where the cross-continental element starts to come into play. And having a licensed entity that has got the technical infrastructure, the compliance frameworks, and the expertise in the markets on the other side of the equation, I think that's going to be really, really crucial to their ongoing success. Absolutely. Um, and obviously, you know, Flutterwave are doing a huge amount of very impressive things as you mentioned they have also been hit by a couple of scandals recently um you know some some issues in the press in 2022 do you think there's any any element of of that in this potentially is it going to impact on how they move forward into 2023 how does how does it look for them in, in going into this new year yeah, I think uh, any business that grows as quickly as Flutterwave has over the last few years, they're likely for mistakes to be made. 
And I think it's also very important to highlight that these mistakes are not at all uncommon in this space. I think uh, it was just December uh, 21st that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in the U.S. announced uh, that Wells Fargo has to pay $3.7 billion in fines for various transgressions and mismanagement over the years. If you look at um, similar examples from the U.K., the FCA fined uh, TSB Bank £29.75 million last year, Julius Bay International, 18 million last year, Citigroup, 12.5 million. I think in regulated spaces, you start to realize that you can start out with the best of intentions, but due to like structural issues and experience, so many different factors that come into play, it's easy for mistakes to be made. And when these mistakes get made, they do have significant consequences. People do lose money. And, you know, it, it is an unfortunate reality of the, the industry that we play in today. Now, speaking specifically to Flutter Waves, um, I think they, they, they have growing pains. And it looks like, based on investor sentiment and what we can hear from the outside looking in, a lot of those growing pains have uh, been resolved. A lot of progress has been made. I think they have brought in more experienced executives to put in place proper governance structures that can ensure that some of these small mistakes, um, and even the larger ones that they may have made in the past, um, simply don't continue. But I think it's it's really too early to say whether or not that's going to have any impact. I think from a regulatory perspective, perceptions do matter a lot here on the continent. Certainly, all of the regulators, the central bank governors do talk to each other uh, about everything that's happening in this space. But they have made a lot of headway over the years in, in towards uh, improving their governance. And I think that's by far the most important thing. And if this Rails deal goes through, I think there's going to be a bunch of super talented people bringing in that global compliance perspective to further strengthen their governance structure. Absolutely. Um, Charlie, what, what's, what was your take on, on this story? Have you heard anything about the Rails of Sale that kind of helps understand why, why is this happening now? What, what's driving it? It seems in some way to be a bit of a, a kind of tale of the year where we saw, I think it was you know, 12 months ago, Rails was raising cash at reportedly you know, near unicorn valuation, 100 million. Um, it was raising, I mean, um, and then that, you know, raised again in, in the summer a massively cut valuation. I think there's, you know, reports of a round of layoffs going on, cash flow troubles in the second half of the year. But as, as Weezer kind of touched on there, it's it seems to be a logical deal to tie up. It's still a you know a, a great business. It does just seem to be one of the fintechs that has been hit by the horrible downturn that is, you know, a lot of the market is facing. I think it was a, a company that was scaling very quickly and 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 now is unfortunately probably feeling the pinch as the um, the economic conditions turn against them. Um, you know, Flutterwave, as Weezer touched on as well, it's a, a, you know, a real force to be reckoned with. And that seems to be the name that's being bandied around at the moment as the most serious suitor. So it'll be very interesting to see um, how it develops over the next couple of weeks and months. Absolutely. Benjamin, um, you know, would would you like to see this this sale go through for for Flutterwave? Obviously, you know, as we touched on, there are some some other competitors potentially as well vying for vying for them. Do you think it would be a good thing for African fintech as a whole if it still went through? Um, yeah, so I don't know what the value is for Flutterwave. To be honest, I'm just going to pick that perspective or opinion. Um, like, if the issue is getting an EMI license, they can apply for one themselves. We're in the process of doing that. It's not super complicated. So, like, how much value is this actually creating for Flutterwave? If you have an EMI license, you have to have directorates sitting in the UK. Are Floodwave willing to move their CEO or C-level to the UK uh, for operating their business that primarily operates out of Nigeria and across multiple African countries, right? So, like, there's many other things that Floodwave need to consider in this acquisition. Will it actually go through? Like, if it does, great. But if it doesn't, like, it doesn't stop Floodwave from achieving what they want to achieve. Um, if the value is the EMI license, if it's passporting across Europe, getting something in Lithuania or Ireland set up, like, they can still do that themselves directly today. So I don't know how much that value would actually create for them today versus them just doing it on their own um, and having a clean set of books. Because if you take Rails on, you also take on all the liabilities, all the companies that they've taken on. Remember, Rails acquired Wirecard. Wirecard had a huge mess um, and everything was had to get taken away from there. And the amount of fintech companies that were affected by that was a lot and exorbitant, right? Um, being a banking as a service provider, people come to you because maybe it's the fast way to enter the market. You know, you also have a lot of risky clients that um, are involved with Railza. So uh, these are realistic things we have to to consider. And so um, whether it's Fadawave, whether it's somebody else, um, you know, great. If it's Fadawave, cool. Um, 
Weezer and I both know GB, we, who's the founder and CEO of Floodwave, and we have full respect for him um, and have worked with him in multiple capacities. But if it's not Floodwave, I don't think it's the end of the world for them. I think they have multiple other opportunities. And so whoever does acquire Railza um, will have to really consider these pieces and elements and the liability they will have to be taking on. And are they ready for it? Um, I think uh, Charlie touched on it briefly is... My prediction is I think there's going to be a lot more M&A activity happening, especially in the UK fintech scene over the next uh, year and a half to two years. Um, I think many companies raised on ideas or, as they say in England, vibes, um, that they'd hope to like do a certain uh, amount of things, but realistically... Um, are now being fact checked. Like, okay, revenue. Show us the re- show us the money. Investors are asking them that, which probably should have asked them as they were raising that money in the first place. And so, um, as we grow the business, I think uh, many companies are going to be seeing some corrections. Whether they're going to see down rounds, like we saw with Railza, from what a billion dollar valuation to two hundred fifty million dollars just within a year, um, or even less than a year, or are they going to see? you know, acquisitions taking place or people who have a little bit more cash um, are going to drive that. Or what I hope to see is true businesses being built. Uh, Businesses is built on revenue and not negative margins because uh, that's what I would hope to see in the fintech space, not just in the UK, but globally. For sure. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think we're definitely going to be hearing a lot about M&A activity across, across this year. So I won't be surprised if it crops up into more stories. Awesome. We'd love to chat about this all day, but we've got a ton of other news stories that we need to dig into as well. So I'm just going to move us on to our, our next story now. Uh, and that is from Tech Cabal. And that is that Nala is expanding into Europe to enable cross-border payments. Nala, a Tanzanian fintech company, has expanded its services into the European market. This expansion will allow the fintech to operate in 19 European countries and enable cross-border payments from them to African countries. Over 11 million African migrants live in Europe, meaning Nala's expansion has the potential for significant impact by providing more options to send money from Europe to Africa. Nala's expansion follows in the footsteps of Nigerian blue chip technologies after the software company expanded into Europe earlier this year. Benjamin, great to have you on here to talk about this exciting announcement. Obviously going to come to you first. Why is this the right time for you guys to be expanding into Europe? Thank you. I mean, we've worked really hard across the UK. So our largest customer base live in the UK and uh, send money to uh, multiple countries in Africa. So currently we serve uh, five countries in Africa. Um, and, you know, obviously I, I'm Tanzanian. So Tanzania is home base originally for me. Um, I grew up there. I actually just got my BRP two days ago in England. So I can be, uh, you know, working uh, as well because we have an office here and I've not been able to even work from our UK office because I'm not, you know, anyway, UK immigration is another discussion for another day. <laughs> (laughs) (laughs) Um, Regardless, there's a lot of Africans who live in Europe, Um, just historical relationships between both regions, trade relationships between both regions. um, And there's a massive opportunity there. You know, Africa is unfortunately the most expensive region in the world to send money to. Um, Globally across Africa, one thing you have to remember is the dollar is the world's trading currency. Um, You know, all of global trade still happens across USD that primarily happens in Africa. Now across the African continent, there's a massive dollar shortage. Therefore, the difference between like um, currencies, um, you can find between the min market rate and the buying and bid and ask rate that you're seeing uh, from banks can be up to four to 5%, making Africa the most expensive region in the world to send money to because there's many issues foundationally with the continent. Um, and, And, what we're trying to do as an organization is how do we re- use technology to reduce the cost of trade? Uh, you know, initially starting with remittances. I don't like the word remittances. We get boxed in be- to being called the remittance company. I don't call ourselves a remittance company. I call ourselves a payments company. And as we looked at it, uh, we've grown quite a bit in the UK. Um, you know, you've probably maybe seen us on the tube here and there in England. Um, but one of the things that we, we've been really focused on is like, how do we connect the African diaspora globally? Um, the US is our second largest market after the UK. And as we look across uh, Europe, there is a lot of Africans who live, you say 11 million people. I I think if you include unofficial numbers, it's probably 20 million people. In the UK alone, for example, um, when we go to the Kenyan High Commission, they tell us there are 312,000 registered Kenyans in the UK. 
Um, however, when you ask the ambassador, what do you think the unofficial number is? They'll tell you probably 600,000 Kenyans in the UK, right? Um, you know, there's probably 1.4 million South Africans in the UK. There's probably 1.3 million Nigerians in the UK. Um, there's a lot of Africans live just within this region. And um, how are you enabling them to trade? Uh, one fun fact, Charlie, Weezer, you know, um, I'd love to take you guys to Far East London. Most of the barber shops and salons there are money transfer shops. You go into the barber shop and you tell them like, hey, I'd love to send money to Ghana. The barbershop owner will pull up their cell phone, show you 15 WhatsApp groups and ask you, um, Charlie, what rate do you want today? And uh, you'll tell them, OK, I I'll pick this rate. You hand them cash. The money will get delivered in Ghana in three hours. That is how, remember, the competition here is not digital. It's all offline. The manual Hawala networks that's built through WhatsApp groups today is still the dominant player in cross-border payments. Now, how to reduce that friction, how to reduce the cost of onboarding people, like that's the opportunity across Europe and initially with consumers, but primarily with businesses that trade between the regions. Yeah, I think that's that's so true what you're saying about the competition not being not being in like the established financial space. Um I did some some work in, in Ghana a couple of years ago and someone showed me the exact same experience of yeah, kind of getting that FX uh, exchange rate kind of via WhatsApp and it's it's a phenomenal customer experience, you know, in terms of the speed and the <laughs> uh, the accuracy of it and then and yeah, it's 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 phenomenal. So that that's what you really have to compete with. Um I mean you've touched on some of the I suppose problems that you're hoping to solve for for consumers, but I suppose what were some of the problems that you guys have had to overcome as an organization just to make this expansion possible? What what's what have been the main barriers for you to move into Europe? Well, I will say holding a Tanzanian passport did not help. Um, you know, <laughs> well, just compliance and reviews and things like that, you know, just following the law, right? So, like, um, as we're trying to get approvals, the approval process for us, you know, police reports, validation, making sure I'm a real person, making sure we had to go through significant, not just across Europe, but even when we're doing this in the U.S., and that's difficult, right? It, it makes it harder for African entrepreneurs who are building global businesses to even expand because, there are immigration laws that, you know, make it a little bit trickier. And so, like, it's like, okay, can this person be a director of a company that operates in Europe? Um, and all these other questions pop up, right? Um, and so, I mean, it, it's been good. I think a, a few things that I would love, the, the few positives I'd love to see uh, and happen across many of the regions and a few things that are a little bit tricky. For example, um, in, in locations like Germany or the Netherlands, um, you know, Many people have Maestro cards or IBAN, um, you know, and so being able to bring them on, because right now we support visas and MasterCard cards, uh, making sure we have enough payment partners that can support us that way, right? And so like different payment partners, the moment you say you deal with African payments, they're like, oh, you're on the highest risk, which means it's the most expensive one, which also keeps costs really high, which is completely opposite to what we're trying to do. Um, and until you build that level of trust with different payment partners, they won't take you on, right? And so I think that has been some of the challenges that we face. So like, how do we keep costs low when payment partners are also trying to de-risk, but because we serve a region that is listed as high risk, um, um, it becomes really expensive for us to service that market. And so um, those are some of the challenges that we've seen. Uh, we're very hopeful, like the initial, uh, you know, feedback we've gotten from our customers in Europe have been phenomenal. Like our largest customer base is Germany, then France now, and then Finland, surprisingly, third. It's just when people love the product, they just tell all their friends about it. And then all of a sudden we just have users picking up and like, why is Finland our, are you one of our fastest growing regions? Um, so that's been uh, really exciting to see. We'd love to service other markets, but right now we only service uh, euro uh, for currency. So Switzerland, uh, the Kron in uh, Sweden and so on, we don't serve right now. Sounds like, a, yeah, enough to keep you busy, certainly in the, certainly in the short term. Um, we said, I'd love to get your perspective. Um, you know, Benjamin's touched on, on their expansion. It's an interesting question, I think, that all f scaling fintechs have is, you know, do you want to focus on expanding markets first or do you want to focus on, you know, broadening out your, your product offering or innovating kind of your, your your product roadmap. So what do you think is is more important? Is it that market expansion and getting the growth there or is it building out the product? Um, I think at, at some point you kind of have to balance a trade-off between both, uh, but that market ex expansion is certainly very crucial. Uh, I'm pretty excited about the Nala news, um, even though some might be wondering because Chippa would be perceived to be a competitor, but uh, as my my landlord is the CEO of MFS Africa, they probably terminate the most value from all of the UK-based remittance companies into Africa. He'll tell you that the competition is with cash. Um, yesterday, I was trying to send money to myself in Malawi. I'm originally from Malawi, right next to Tanzania. So Benji's is my country neighbor. Um, and I was 
using my US issued debit card with World Remit, which is probably one of the most reliable services for sending money to Africa today. And I was supposed to get the money in 10 minutes. It took 36 hours. And I work at Chipper Cash. I have Benji on WhatsApp. The CEO of MFS Africa is my landlord. I can call any bank CEO on the continent. And <laughs> I can just imagine how difficult this problem is for regular people who are outside the space and don't understand what's happening. I think there's still a very, very big um, opportunity to lower the cost of those remittances because within the continent, within individual countries, the financial services infrastructure is very sophisticated and robust and you can move money around very quickly, especially in countries like Kenya and Nigeria. Now, going back to your initial question, like, um, because individual markets in Africa are perceived to be small, especially from like a venture perspective vis-a-vis -vis the other opportunities that exist globally, it is fundamentally important to de-risk your business by being able to demonstrate to investors that you can operate in more than one market. Um, apart from that, we have seen instances where when there's deep concentration risk, uh, and a sudden rev regulatory shift takes place, like we've seen with the uh, remittance industry into Nigeria. It was a massive, massive business, billions of dollars moving in every year. And then in 2020, the Central Bank of Nigeria says, you can't terminate Naira into Nigeria internationally anymore. It has to come in as US dollars. A lot of businesses were wiped out overnight, and that can happen to to anybody in any country. So I do think it's it's really important to to, to do both but to start with that market diversification. And certainly I'm a very big fan and avid user of Nala. I think they've got a fantastic future and there's so much more to come. Charlie, I think we're going to have to interrupt this love fest to, uh, <laughs> to, to get you into the story. What's, um, <laughs> what's your take on, on how investors in London are looking at uh, obviously, as we've heard from from Weezer and Benjamin, like, huge opportunities here, huge customer audiences. What's kind of the, the investor perspective on this opportunity, would you say? So we actually looked at this in some depth last year when um, Flutterwave raised its big round and there was, a, you know, US investors packed on the ticket and there was no UK investors. And we were kind of asking why that is. And I think the UK, when you look in relative terms, has been a bit slow off the mark compared to US investors. Um, and I think speaking with some of the kind of fintech specialists in, in the UK who do specialise in, in looking at opportunities in Africa, there is quite depressing reasons behind it they they cited that you know there is perhaps this slightly archaic view from uk investors that um you know africa isn't a place you invest for commercial reasons you maybe go for grant funding and i think that's certainly changing i think you know look at the figures last year that africa was the only region where venture investment ticked upwards um on 2021 levels and everyone else you know saw some pretty horrible falls as we'll come on to um so I think it's certainly changing, but I think, yeah, the UK has been perhaps slow off the mark, but that the size of the, the market, the growth um, and its potential is probably, you know, people are really taking that in, in the UK now as well. Wiesa, there's one last thing I'd like to get your your take on. Um, obviously, it feels like remittance is, is, obviously we've talked about not using that word potentially, but um, is it, do governments and regulatory bodies have a have a responsibility to kind of really make sure that this space works more efficiently? We've we've seen how important it is to consumers, what huge volumes of payments are going through. What role do governments and regulatory bodies have to play in making this work? Yeah, I think they have a very big, if not the biggest role, especially in emerging markets where remittances are a significant GDP contributor. If you look at Nigeria and Egypt, that's like 6 and 6.7% 6 respectively. So it's not um, a small or inconsequential amount. And we have seen the adverse effects. We have seen what happens to remittance volumes when um, regulatory changes that are made that aren't uh, conducive to efficiency. For example, Nigeria used to be a multi-billion dollar annual remittance market. Those figures have dropped off a cliff to several hundreds of millions of dollars now through formal channels because of changes in regulation. When you look at South Africa, there's a balance of payments form that has to be um, completed by everybody who has a bank account. Um, once every year for them to receive international remittances. There's a lot of friction in the system. It takes three to four days. So what tends to happen is that people tend to opt for the Howlout networks, which are unsafe. They're unsafe for them. They're unsafe for the regulator. There's no visibility. And the exchange rates are often higher than what you might get at the bank. So certainly regulation has a key role to play. And I think regulators need to get more active in making sure that they can create an enabling environment for the next generation of remittance tools to come. 
For sure. Well, I, I believe you know, we probably could chat about this all day, but um, just want to say, Benjamin, congrats again on on the expansion. And fingers crossed, this is just the first step in your in your inevitable march to world domination. So, watch this space. We're just going to take a quick pause here. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> Here at 11FS, we believe in explaining FS without the BS. That's why we created our 11FS Explore series, weekly videos that break down a complicated financial services topic into something everyone can get their head around, such as... On Rampy. Buy now, pay later. The cost of living. ESG. Stable points. Telematics insurance. And inclusive design. Search 11FS Explores on YouTube now. Welcome back. Let's get into our next story. Um, we've taken this one from City AM, so Charlie, watch, watch out. I'm going to come to you first on this one. UK fintech funding tumbles amid global slowdown, but London remains well ahead of global rivals. Investment into the UK's fintech sector slumped 8% last year, according to figures from Innovate Finance. However, London remained well ahead of rival hubs in Europe and Asia amid a sharp global slowdown. The UK's fintech sector attracted some $12.5 billion worth of capital, down from a bumpy year in 2021, which saw $13.5 billion pumped into the country's fintech firms. Innovate Finance's Janine Hurt told CityM, Our latest report shows that the UK is still receiving more investment in fintech than all of the next 10 European countries combined, and remains second in the world only to the US. So, Charlie, you covered this for, for CityM, so I'd love to get your take on this first. Is the UK fintech scene feeling that eight percent drop in funding? How does that? How is that playing out, kind of out in the real world? So I think this story is very much a kind of glass half full, glass half empty um, one to look at because you know the top line figure, as you can see there, the investment fell eight percent in any other year. I think that would be a, a really you know grim statistic to read, but it wasn't. Didn't come as a surprise. We saw that throughout the year. You know the way that kind of rate hikes, volatility on the market completely shuttered the exit market as well. Um, we saw that coming throughout the year, and I think this figure wasn't necessarily a surprise. And particularly, you know, compared as you mentioned there to the the 2021 figure, it was always going to be a, a sort of fairly grim read. I think at the start of the year, so I think the glass half full reading of that in London, particularly, would be that you know, it, the, the fall in London and the fall in the UK hasn't been as sharp as the global average. If you look at global funding. The figures um, that Innovate Finance put out this week showed that there was a, a fall of about a third <clears throat> globally. So there is some positives to be taken in London that the you know funding does seem to be holding up slightly stronger than the uh, the global average. And for those of us in London, you know we're a London publication. Um, if you look at it, London as a standalone, as a separate entity to the UK, we're becoming in second only to the US. So I think. In answer to your specific question, um, you know businesses are obviously feeling the pinch. We touched on rails earlier. Um, you know, having to, to kind of raise money at a massive down round in the summer and then uh, towards an M&A event this year. So there's, you know, it's well covered that businesses certainly are feeling the pinch and that there's been a complete shift in how businesses are pitching themselves to investors. You know, we're looking more at how you're going to reach profitability quicker rather than growth at all costs. So certainly, you know, it's being felt, but I think there's some positives to be taken and that maybe venture funding and into London in the UK is holding up perhaps stronger um, than other markets. And what, why do you think it is that London is is holding up, is managing to avoid that impact that maybe other European hubs have, have seen more strongly? I, I think it speaks really to, you know, historically London has been, you know, really sort of quick moving in, in creating a regulatory and, and a political environment as well that has kind of championed fintech. We've seen that over the past couple of years, things like you look at the SCA creating the regulatory sandbox, it's really kind of encouraged firms to come here and try their products in an environment they can we've you know i think the visa regime uh, that is being rolled out now after the khalifa review um has been sort of trying to create an environment where talent can come in to work in these high growth companies as well um we're seeing changes to the listing rules i think you know companies can see that there is although maybe these these changes aren't perhaps bearing fruit yet there is a lot of political momentum around making um you know a move on to the public markets for fintech and have high growth tech firms um, as as kind of friendly as possible, if you will. Um, so I think it's it speaks to kind of a historical dominance of London over the past fifteen years and a real move to try and make it as welcoming as possible for fintech firms, and that's sort of playing out now as in those figures. Hmm. Benjamin, you you touched on it. Obviously, you guys have got a London office as as well. How much does 
location really matter? You know, did these lists based on you know, countries and cities make sense in a globalized world? Um, I think they do to a certain extent, right? I'm, I mean, we've seen a lot of tech companies move back and like try to cancel this whole like, oh, full Zoom culture. Now they have a lot of hybrid culture. Now it's like, okay, no, we want people in office at least three times a week. Um, and we're seeing that in many country uh, companies across the world, right? Um, in the quote unquote post COVID world. Uh, but when does that end, right? Some people like. You know, if I hire some people in the UK, they're like, no, I only want to join Nala because I want to work remotely. I don't want to work in the in the office. And you have a, a, a flip of, of many different things happening. Regarding location-based things, there's, there's a few items that I want us to keep in mind. In 2021, there were 11,000 new cash millionaires in the United States. These were because of all the IPOs that happened uh, in the US. Uh, these are young people, probably under the age of 30, that became cash millionaires because of all the IPOs because they joined a lot of these early tech companies at a young age, worked there for five to six years. Um, you know, the company went public, they earned a lot of money. Now, what's happening is because in Silicon Valley, San Francisco area, people have seen, you know, what being early in a tech company means and seen the cash benefits of being there financially. There's a lot of people who are willing to invest into more tech companies. So the risk appetite for a lot of those people is still there, right? And the USA will lead globally for a very, very long time because the USA leads globally in technology today, uh, in tech companies at least, right? Um, so what does that mean, right? So because there's a lot of risk appetite available, those people who just made a lot of money are starting their own micro funds, starting their own small seed funds, or starting their own micro VC funds here and there, and looking for early stage tech companies to invest in. So at the end of the day, like, you know, the discussion we had earlier, we are seeing an interest in, like, people investing into the, like, say, African region, which I'm part of, from the USA to be significantly higher versus the UK or even Europe, right? And because people have made those and seen those exits before, you haven't seen those exit massively across Europe. You've seen a few across the UK. Um, you know, one can argue companies like TransferWise should have gone public in New York instead of in London at the London Stock Exchange, right? And so there's all these debates that are, are created. Um, and because there's more cash readily available, maybe that's why we haven't seen it as much in London versus uh, across Europe. I'm not knocking on European entrepreneurs. It's just an ecosystem that hasn't seen as much exits compared to the United States. Oh, that's, um, that's a really interesting take. Weezer, what do you reckon? Um, I definitely agree with points raised by both Charlie and Benji here. What's interesting for me is that like, I see a lot of emerging markets entrepreneurs choose to incorporate and headquarter their business in the UK because it's pretty accessible with Africa. Time zones are a very, very big differentiator versus somewhere like San Francisco, where with the UK, you've got like an hour's difference with Lagos as opposed to six or seven hours with San Francisco. That's a very big game changer. Another one is that's the immigration, the tech nation visas. I can't count with both hands how many Nigerian founders I personally know who have moved from Lagos to London than this year. Um, and it is pretty important for them to be able to build their teams and access global talent and talent and London sort of plays a role as a hub for that. If I can draw from an adjacent industry example yesterday, uh, a company called InstaDeep, which um, is founded by Tunisian founders from Tunisia, born in Tunis, they uh, sold their company to BioNTech. Um, the company that uh, collaborated with Pfizer for the mRNA va vaccine that is uh, uh, hopefully still flowing through my veins and keeping me safe uh, for about 398 to 562 million pounds, depending on who you ask. So it's pretty interesting to see how TechCrunch reports that they say BioNTech acquires Tunisian born and UK based AI startup InstaDeep for 562 million. But then the FT is reporting it as uh, though InstaDeep is a purely UK startup that's being acquired. I think the lines are definitely blurred. I can't tell you if InstaDeep is Tunisian or uh, British uh, in this sense, but certainly what is very clear is that the founders made an intentional decision to domicile the business in the UK because it made these types of transactions much more easy to achieve in practice. Yeah, but at the same time, can I just jump in really quickly? Um, investors are more comfortable investing into entities that operate in markets they're familiar with, right? So for example, every single 
Y Combinator tech company uh, that comes from Africa is registered in the U.S. So are they U.S. businesses at the end of the day? Because at the end of the day, the holding entity is a U.S. entity, right? Uh, Chipper Cash is a U.S. business. Floodwave is a U.S. business, right? Nala, we have a U.S. entity as well, right? So we are all included in the same cycle. So what is an African business at the end of the day is, is the, the question that comes up. So um, I, I think the Luis has, has made some really valuable points around that. But uh, the one I really feel strongly about is definitely the location piece because uh, the, where the U.K. sits with, like, different regions, like Africa, is perfect location for time zone for employment as well as work. We've been very complimentary of, of London, I suppose. I'll try and bring a little bit of a balance back to it. Maybe I'm wrong. But, um, you know, Charlie, there was a lot of criticism in the aftermath of, of Brexit, you know, that we were going to see a sort of brain drain out of London, that London was going to become less attractive as, as a place to build build teams and build products. As a result, you know, has that come to pass? Have, have we seen that play out? Or was, was that sort of people being over paranoid, do you think? I think that it, there's obviously been a huge effort to stop it happening i think fintech was one of the things that london and the uk could actually say you know we're, we're globally leading in it was a, you know an industry where we'd made a huge effort in, in advance of brexit to to kind of create an environment that it could flourish and i think therefore you know beyond that we've seen things like the khalifa review we're seeing it now with um new rules being you know drawn up for crypto the uk supposedly making itself a, a global hub for crypto for better or worse um, so I think, you know, there's been this political emphasis and this regulatory emphasis. And because of that, and, you know, just a level of conversation around it as well, coming from the top, I think, you know, you can argue how effective some of these reforms are. But I think even just paying lip service to it has kind of kept it front of mind and kept it as a, a global de destination. So certainly the if you look at the funding figures, they speak for themselves as well. They, they kind of continue ticking upwards. And as we've touched on here, there hasn't been too sharp a drop off. So I don't think the the impact of Brexit has been bad in in that that sense. I'm not speaking in other senses at all. Um, I just think, you know, if we look at the figures and the sort of investment figures and, and how the industry is performing, it perhaps hasn't had the impact that some feared it might. For sure, yeah. Um, yeah, as, as you say, we've, we've spoken a lot about fundraising figures in, in, in this story. Um, for our listeners, you know, if you're interested in finding out a bit more about some other metrics you can look at for measuring success in fintech, you can check out episode 685 of Fintech Insider, wherever you get your podcasts. Our next story comes from BBC, and that is that Jack Ma is to give up control of fintech giant Ant Group. The billionaire founder of Ant Group, Jack Ma, is to give up control of the Chinese fintech giant after a regulatory crackdown. Ant Group runs Alipay, the main online payment system in China, which has eclipsed cash, checks and credit cards. Mr. Ma has seldom been seen in public since criticising China's financial sector in 2020. Following that criticism, Ant Group's planned stock market flotation was abruptly halted. Ant Group said that after the change, no one would have overall control. Mr. Ma, a former English teacher who founded e-commerce giant Alibaba, directly and indirectly controls more than 50% of Ant Group. However, after the changes in governance structure, he will control just over 6%, according to an Ant Group statement. Well, as, 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 um, as alluded to kind of in the intro, we've been kind of keeping an eye on this since for a couple of years now. Um, Charlie, w were you surprised to see this? Has Jack Ma's time in charge always been always been at risk yeah I, I don't think it was a surprise really you know it seems like a fairly natural culmination of, of what we've seen over the past couple of years there has been this regulatory and political crackdown on the tech sector it's it's really sort of hampered valuations it's is you know it's had huge knock-on effects across global markets so i think this was you know chinese government seems like they've been trying to keep jack Ma in check for quite a long time now and perhaps this was a fairly predictable conclusion to the saga. Wiza, how how much of a global force is China's fintech scene now? Would you would you say? Um, I think it's it's an interesting like case study to observe for uh, other markets potentially, but you really don't have the same ingredients that uh, are able to make uh, China uh, the successful that market that it is today in other markets. Um, in the beginning, in the infancy of the industry, it does seem that the Chinese regulator was very progressive and enabled this level of innovation to take place. Outside of Alipay, we've also seen quite a lot of success from WeChat, who I think are now second by market share uh, in China. But you've got this like single, large, contiguous regulatory market 
with a mass of people that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So I think that like success is dip- difficult to replicate in any other environment, but it does present an interesting case study that maybe countries like India that have got similar population size, but a more decentralized government structure could potentially use to observe. I think it's also worth highlighting the degree of sophistication and integration of China's government systems in general. I mean, it's no secret to anyone who's listening about their version of the internet and all of the structures that they've put in place to sort of like create this cozy walled garden that um, they have a high degree of control over. And you just don't see that that degree of government involvement in the sector anywhere else. And I think we've gotten to see the upside of what happens when that helps. And we've also gotten to see the downside of what happens um, with this uh, uh, a really unfortunate end to what seems to be Jack Ma's uh, story with, with Ant Group in the way that we've known it so far. Benjamin, do you think it'll be the end of Jack Ma's story of Ant Group? I mean, obviously there's lots of rumours now about what, what he might do next. What, what, what do you see him doing next? I mean, I think he's fine and he's he's good, right? Like, if he doesn't work a day in his life again, like, he's fine financially too. So, I mean, it's, it's up to him and what he wants to do. Does he want to get involved in the payment space? Does he want to just take the philanthropy, which he's, all, he's also doing quite a bit of? Does he want to just go on vacation? Um, does he want to start a fund uh, in London to help uh, UK uh, tech companies? Um, it's all up to him, right? So, um, even if he exits, um, I, I don't think, you know, putting myself in his position, you know, uh, I I, th- I don't know. There was a lot of rumors that happened from different stories about, you know, when he went missing and what's going on. Um, foundationally, I don't know what the truth actually is. Um, I don't know what to believe anymore in the news after FTX. Um, but yeah, I think uh, if 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 he does uh, get involved in all the industries, I I think good for him. And I think if anything, he'd be an inspiration for many um, entrepreneurs across the world. Yeah, I, I don't think we should be worrying too much about somebody who's got a ninety meter long super yacht. Like I think, he'll, I think, hope, fingers crossed, as you say, now that he's reappeared back in public life, he'll he'll be okay on a personal level. I suppose I'm interested to get your perspective on, you know, how you think, what impact do you think this will have on on Alipay? I suppose obviously they are like the payments giant globally. Obviously, a huge amount of that has been focused on 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 China, but. You know, before before all this happened, I suppose there was a lot of chat about was Alipay going to expand? What impact was that going to have on on payments globally? I suppose what what do you how do you see this this change of organizational structure impacting payments globally? So one thing that's really interesting to watch is seeing uh, China's relationship with multiple regions around the world, right? So, for example. China in many African countries where, you know, that's home for me, right? Tanzania's home, uh, is some of African countries' largest trading partner. Uh, there's a lot more imports that are happening from Africa, uh, like, you know, from, to, to Africa from China, right? And therefore, that corridor for payments is massive. You know, one of our biggest requests from our customers is, hey, can you enable us to send money from Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania to China for b- goods and services? And these are not small transactions. These are large containers worth of items that people are importing and trading, right? And so I do think Alipay has a massive global opportunity for trade. Uh, and how it wants to handle itself, especially with regions like Africa, is a massive opportunity. I think it's just at the beginning, nascent stage. I think I always say payments in Africa are 1% built, and if Alipay is going to help it move it to 2%, I think even if they connected payments across 54 countries in Africa, that would take it to 2%. There's still so much more that needs to be done. So I don't think it's the end of Alipay. I think it's just foundation in the beginning. In in startup world, you always say startups begin with generalists and scale with specialists. And I think now is the spe- specialist time for Alipay to truly shine. For sure. Um, Charlie, I'm interested to get your take on, on Jack Ma's I, mean, I was going to say the word legacy as if, as if he's kind of died and disappeared, which obviously we, we're, not, we're not saying that he has. But if this is the end of his time with Alipay specifically, you know, what, what do you think his, his, his legacy will, will be? You know, I think he's quite often sort of seen almost as one of those like iconic founding figures of, of fintech. You know, if there was going to be a sort of Mount Rushmore of, of fintech, do you think he'd be one of those founding fathers that we would put on, up, up, up on it? What, what do you reckon? I think he's, he's in a a sort of imposing figure across the the world of fintech and tech, just in the sense that he has at times been, you know, the foil to what has seemed like an all-powerful Chinese Communist Party. And he he has very much been pitched as that by, um, it seems, by by the party himself as well. So 
you know, his legacy, as as Benjamin's kind of touched on there, he's he's kind of secured that. And I'm sure if even if he worked another day in his life, he would be a, a fairly monumental figure. Um, whether he does work another day in his life, we'll see. But I think it's, you know, the, the kind of track record speaks for itself in that sense. For sure. OK, now for the section of the show called Big Click Energy, a quick fire roundup of some more click worthy news this week. So starting us off uh, from AltFi, Visa and Enfuse pilot prepaid cards for refugees in France. Visa is piloting a project with card issuing and payment processing fintech Enfuse, as well as neobank Welcome.Place to bring prepaid cards to refugees entering France. Together, the companies have created a prepaid Visa card preloaded with funds for refugees and immigrants to spend on a range of items and services in their first few weeks after arrival. The card will come as part of a welcome package for people arriving in France, distributed by Welcome.Place, which was established last year as a community driver neobank to help newcomers settle as quickly as possible. The aim is to help 50,000 Ukrainian and other refugees by the end of 2023. Well, obviously, fingers crossed for the pilot, and, but it goes well, as it sounds you know, on paper like a, like a great initiative. We've already seen Revolut make some changes to their account offer to support Ukrainian refugees and rejigging the documentation required for onboarding and removing some of the FX and top-up fees that they had in place. You know, I'm sure maybe some other fintechs have done similar things. But um, but the fact that this card is going to be preloaded with funds feel like it feels like it's going that extra step to help these dislocated communities re-establish themselves. And if it works in France, and I'd love to see if it can be rolled out in, in other markets, I believe that kind of the current estimate is that around 8 million people have fled Ukraine. So obviously, you know, trying to reach 50,000 in France is a lot, but it's just scratching the surface really of the issue across Europe as a whole. Uh, and if you want to find out a bit more about how fintech can help solve the refugee crisis, you can go check out episode 657 of Fintech Insider Insights, where Nicole Perry and Sarah Habib spoke to guests from Bunk, Leaf and Techfugees. And we also wanted to give a shout out for Open Banking, which has turned five. So Friday, January the 13th, very auspicious, marked the fifth anniversary of the rollout of PSD2 in the UK. For many, this is seen as the birth of open banking in the UK and arguably worldwide. In the five years since, we've seen huge companies built on the back of the growing open banking regulation across the world. Despite this, open banking still has its critics. For an industry perspective, we reached out to Tom Burton, Director of External Affairs and Public Policy at Go Cardless, who gave us his thoughts on this anniversary. Last week, open banking in the UK turned five. Going from zero to nearly seven million active users in that time is a fantastic achievement. Certainly great news for the consumers and businesses who are now benefiting from better, safer banking experiences and cheaper payments. And the UK economy is winning as well. We're getting jobs and investment in this space. We should celebrate these accomplishments, but also look to the future. The CMA has just declared the open banking roadmap substantially complete. What replaces it will be crucial for determining success in the next five years. So what birthday gift do we need from the government and regulators? Firstly, broader, tougher compliance for the open banking standard, done with a mindset of banks competing to deliver the best possible service. That means we need the right balance between regulation and commercial incentives. Secondly, allow open banking to flourish across as many different use cases as possible. And at the same time, maybe we need a hero use case, like what the London Transport Network did for increasing usage and trust in contactless card payments. Third, trust again. The customer experience is so critical for adoption and there are quick wins for improving things, like making sure high value transactions go through seamlessly and providing instant confirmations. Nobody wants to sit there waiting to see if a payment has happened or not. Lastly, prioritization. Let's focus on what matters and where the market is not solving for itself instead of the million and one other things the regulators could look at. Well, yeah, happy happy birthday to Open Banking. As a, as a gift to Open Banking, I'm going to ask each of you guys for a quick fire rating you know, out of, out of 10. What, what score would you give? Would you give open banking at its at its five year birthday, Weezer? What score are you going to give it? Um, I think in the UK it's looking pretty great. I'd probably give it like a seven, seven, eight. Um, it's not the best open banking experience I've seen globally. I think there are others that are much more uh, refined and don't require too much user interaction. But I do think it's set a fantastic template for the rest of the world to follow. And some of the experiences that I'm seeing in markets like South Africa and Kenya on top of mobile money are looking quite exciting indeed. Seven, seven's not too shabby. Benjamin, what's what's your score? Um, 
<laughs> it's a fun one because we do use a lot of open banking with Nile and that enable people to top up accounts. Um, I would say eight. You know why? Because I would love to see more countries across the globe push for it. Um, I think it, it makes transactions cheaper for everybody and the consumer wins at the end of the day. Uh, and large services that were charging ridiculous amounts for fees uh, can kind of stop doing that and find other places to make money. So I, I push it at an eight because I'd love to see an inspiration for more com- countries around the world to do this. Awesome. And Charlie? I will go with a seven, I think, because I think, yeah, as we touched on there, London, uh, UK rather has really set a template. It's been kind of pioneering in that, but there's been some dithering around fairly big decisions like the future of the OBIE. I think that earlier last year, there was real lack of clarity on that. And I think now we're, you know, not going to know what its successor is. So there's perhaps a, a bit of, you know, a lack of clarity on some decisions will probably hold it back from from what it could be. I like it. Nice, nice, nice balance there. Okay, let's focus on a slightly more lighthearted story to close us out this week. And this one comes from the BBC News, and that is that YouTube star Logan Paul has apologised for CryptoZoo project failure. YouTuber Logan Paul has apologised to fans who lost money after investing in his cryptocurrency game CryptoZoo. The 27-year-old encouraged people to buy cryptocurrency collectibles for what he called a really fun game that makes you money. But more than a year after its launch, no game has materialised, and Paul has apparently abandoned the project. Now in response to another YouTuber's investigation into the business, Paul says he wants to make this right. CryptoZoo was launched in 2021 after first being discussed on Paul's podcast, Impulsive. In a now-deleted description, it was described as an autonomous ecosystem that allows zookeepers to buy, sell, and trade exotic animals and hybrids. CryptoZoo incorporates cryptocurrency and non-fungible tokens, NFTs, into a simple, fun game with familiar mechanics. However, after selling millions of dollars worth of NFTs and crypto coins, Paul stopped talking about CryptoZoo and seemingly abandoned the project. We've got any any Logan Pauls on the panel today? Not seeing anyone instantly throw their hand up. Char- Charlie, what, what what was your take on this one? I have enjoyed the the kind of barbs traded in both directions um, between Coffeezilla and Logan Paul. I think you, it seems like we'll probably see the end of these um, celebrity vanity projects without them actually having to be banned because I think people have seen the the horrible state that you know a lot of these it seems like the majority of these celebrities who, who lended their name to crypto have, have got themselves into so i think it's probably going to be one of the last um or you know, maybe that's wishful thinking but one of the last we see of these kind of instances but um i'm sure there'll be some more barbs to come between coffeezilla and logan paul benjamin were you, were you an investor in, in crypto z definitely not um i think I don't know. I think things like FTX this past year have really, unfortunately, like I'm a huge believer in crypto technology, but like it's just really um, hurt the industry massively. And I think crypto has overpromised what it's truly delivered uh, so far. Um, and then I, the, the the sad part is I think the worst is yet to come in the crypto space. I think there's I, actually in the next two to three months, there's some bigger news that's going to happen with some large global players, some that I'm aware of. And I, I think uh, there'll be more unfortunate pieces like this from Logo Paul happening. Oh, well, ominous. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping, I hope you prove wrong. But yeah, I'd have to have to wait and see. Weezer, um, have, you, have you been following this story? Have you been following Logan Paul? Do you think these kinds of influences are, are going to hang around? Or do you kind of agree with Charlie that they're on the way out? Yeah, I think that we we might see a reduction, but like this is not a new thing. Um, throughout every generation, there's always someone exploiting some new thing in order to uh, scam or exploit people. It's it's historically a phenomenon that has existed for hundreds, if not thousands, of years, and it just so happened that um, the crypto wave was the new thing. Um, I got to discover Logan Paul through CoffeeZilla, who I've been watching for a number of years now. And I think he provides some of the more balanced insight into some of these like crypto projects. I think a lot of this is just the result of an extended period of mania that was fueled by the sky high gains that uh, we had been seeing in the markets over the past four or five years. Now that those are gone, I think people are definitely going to be a lot more diligent around making decisions about where to put their money. And the really 
key thing for me is that until there is a proper and robust regulatory framework that exists um, at, at, at like countrywide or continental or global scale, the only people who are going to like lead in the crypto industry are going to be charlatans because I'm not going to quit my day job and start a crypto business today, even though I have the expertise, if I can't figure out how I'm going to run it legally. People who are out to scam people, they don't think about things like that. So I do not think, unfortunately, I have to agree with Benji that this might not be the worst that we've seen. And hopefully a positive outcome is that it drives the need uh, for regulation and helps the regulators see that need more urgently. Well, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's watch this space. Well, sadly, that wraps up this week's new show. Thank you so much to today's guests. It's been great to hear your takes on everything. Where can people find out a bit more about you, Benjamin? Uh, follow me on Instagram. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I used to be an Instagram influencer, but uh, I've cut up <laughs> those days out now that I'm uh, <laughs> run a tech company. Um, you can email me, benjamin at nala.com uh, is probably the best way to reach out to me or Twitter. Awesome. Charlie, what about you? cityam.com pick up a copy of the paper or i'm normally tweeting things as well so uh, that's probably the best way to get me what's your twitter handle charlie conchi awesome and weezer what about you um best place to reach me is on twitter at weezer j um i don't have my dms open so if you want to shoot me an email there's a link on my twitter profile that like leads to a form on my website and then that will uh, shoot me an email directly and i'll be able to get back to you Cool. Uh, and as for me, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Kate Moody, or on Twitter at K8 Moody. And a massive thank you to our listeners for listening. You can join the conversation on social media, email podcast at lemonfest.com and find our mailbag link in the show description. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.